They are among our biggest fruits and vegetables, hearty and delicious. But some squash and melons can be challenging to grow in our northern climates. We'll take you along some avenues to success straight ahead on this edition of Great Gardening. Once the plant is infected, there really isn't anything you can do about it. The, the root flare is right along here, so we want to make sure that's below ground level. Watermelons, musk melons. This is a yellow or gray cone flower. This one's called uh, Picasso in pink. Hello and welcome to Great Gardening, I'm Pamela Fish. Vine crops are on the menu this week, in particular squash, pumpkin and melon. Here to share their wisdom on growing these and all kinds of other plant life are our garden experts, Tom Casper, the president of Duluth Garden Flower Society, and Bob Olin, state and county educator and horticulturist. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for dressing up for us, Tom. <laughs> I've, I felt it was necessary. <laughs> Since we're talking about squash, I wanted to dress up. There you go. All right, good. And I wear short sleeves because I'm an optimist. We you are, are optimistic have summer. about the weather, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we also want to uh, welcome back and thank our phone volunteers from the Carleton County Master Gardeners. They came in to answer the concerns of our gardeners across the region. So call them with your questions or send an email. The numbers are 218-788-2844 or toll free 877-307-8762. You can also email those questions by going to askgardening at wdse.org. Well, you guys have been out planting finally? Yeah, we've been in the field and mm -hmm. uh, things are coming along. It's uh, cool season crops are doing a little bit better than warm season crops, <laughs> I would say, at this point. Yeah. And we might just advise people if they did plant a little earlier, if they got heavy wet soils. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're getting poor seed emergence, you might consider either interplanting at this point or even replanting, okay. but you have to do that very quickly. But we use as a rule of thumb, if, if maybe a, a third of the crop didn't get out of the ground, then you really want to do something very quickly to readdress that problem. That's There's assuming that the frost is out of the ground. <laughs> yeah. I think it is. Yeah. I think yeah. it finally is. But there's still time to do that. There is. You want to move okay. pretty quickly and you want to use short season varieties, but you certainly can, can still replant at this point. Okay. I want to get to just a couple questions. We had some left over from last week, and so I think if we have the time right now, we might as well take them and uh, see, see if we can... Uh, get your, your minds working. Um, Ed from Duluth says, when's the best time to transplant rhubarb? Best time was about uh, a month ago now, okay. in, in all honesty. You want to get them just as they're emerging from the, uh, from the soil. You might get away with it this time of year, but we're getting a little late. They're quite mature at this point. All right. Uh, Mary from near Duluth says, how do you get rid of a bramble bush that's very invasive? Oh, <laughs> a bramble bush, he should, might want we. Yeah, could have could, narrowed that down yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I know, bit. I know. We're but, not sure what exactly that is. It's yeah. an invasive bush that's really brambly. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> okay, now that clears it up. <laughs> um, you know, she can try to dig it out. That's probably best if she can get in and get those uh -huh. roots out or as much of it as possible. She can also try to treat it with a non-selective herbicide and try to knock it down that way. So. Okay. We had some questions emailed in, and uh, one is from Sue Larson who wants to know how to prevent fire blight on her apple trees, and also what do you do to treat that? That's a real challenge. It's one of the more difficult diseases. It's bacterial as opposed to fungal. I think that uh, one thing you want to do is you'll never want to prune an apple during the growing season. You have those mm -hmm. open wounds, so that's one thing we're not okay. going to do. And then um, when you are pruning, you can open them up so there's a little better air circulation. There are a couple of antibiotics that it can be used that are labeled for use for control if you have the infection. Uh, my experience with them has not been real positive. So I would say uh, look for the symptoms. Uh, if it's repetitive, it's on a tree, you might consider actually eliminating that tree so it doesn't spread to some of your other trees. It's a challenge, but you can try all those things. Thin them out. Don't prun prune during the growing season. Okay. And, and if you're really seeing that, you can even try, uh, and some folks have had some success where they've cut at least a foot down from where they see that, that curling or that bishop's hook of the, mm, the branching. Right. Cut at least a foot down, sterilize your pruner to try to eliminate that or remove it from the tree. Some success with that, but again, once it's infected, pretty difficult. 
All right. That may be best to replace. So. Okay, we'll get, we're going to save some of these. We have more questions coming in, but uh, we're talking about vine crops, in particular squash. And if you haven't heard yet, squash is the Duluth vegetable of the year. Just what does that mean? Well, basically, it is that everyone is encour encouraged to grow and eat more squash. Here's more on the effort to promote squash. We thought if we could get everybody in town growing one vegetable, uh, it would be a platform for a lot of conversations about how to grow it and then how to prepare it. And squash is such a, is such a great choice because um, it's, it's a food of the people. It's been a food of the people for thousands of years. Uh, it nourishes, very nourishing. The seeds are, are high in proteins. The, uh, it stores really well. This year we have distributed uh, over 15,000 seeds. I'd say maybe even close to 20,000 seeds. And that's been through public libraries. We've really tried to make seeds accessible. And we've got seeds to um, all the kids in elementary schools in Duluth as well. There's kind of two ways you can go about planting squash. You can put the seeds right in the ground or you can put in transplants. And my personal experience is that transplants are, um, are a little tough. Their roots are really fragile and that, that they tend to look great when you put them in the ground, but they, they're a little stunted. And so in our gardens behind me here, what we've done is we put in some transplants because those, those look great and I'm always hopeful that they're gonna take off, but I've also planted seeds with them. But so we planted um, heirloom varieties in this particular bed here. And we've got uh, some, some Ford Hook acorn, some uh, golden hubbards, which are a nice, great big uh, uh, squash. B wonderful taste and they save really well. And, um, and then a, uh, it's called the Anna Schwartz Hubbard, which um, I really like. It's more like a bowling ball size Hubbard and uh, still saves really well. It, it tastes great. The issue with winter squash is that there's a very small window for planting that if you plant it too early, the roots rot, and if you plant it too late, then you might get great vines and great leaves, but you don't get a, a real good uh, winter squash crop. Traditionally, the way people would grow squash is they would make a nice mound uh, so that the, the soil warms up, uh, it, you get good drainage. Um, you, you wanna keep your so soil moist, but not too wet, so that if you pick up your soil and you squeeze it, uh, you shouldn't be wringing out water. Uh, but it should be moist to the touch. And, uh, and ideally, compost is great. We'll have a potluck and it'll be a squash potluck. And everybody will bring their favorite recipes uh, that they've prepared throughout the year and we'll share those. That's, that's the whole goal, is people eating, eat, people eating healthier and, and enjoying it. Okay, so uh, is there still time to plant squash, Bob? You know, there is, and if people aren't using untreated seed, it might be desirable to plant it later because okay. one of the issues that we've had is cooler soil temperatures. A lot of our soil temperatures mm -hmm. still are below 50 degrees. So that's a challenge from, for some warm season crops. You want to look for the shorter season varieties or some of the summer varieties, and then I would be very deliberate about getting it done within the next day or two. And, and we, you can also look, of course, for transplants at sure. local might garden be centers available. to help mm -hmm. speed it up for you a little sure. bit if you're not seeding. So. Uh, we know there are summer squash and winter squash. We have some pictures to show, and uh, starting with the zucchini. These, of course, are summer squash. These are both zucchini, uh, yellows as well as conventional uh, deep green zucchini. A lot of work's happened there, and a uh, great deal of interest in the yellow zucchini. I think it perhaps surpasses the green zucchini now in terms of demand for a fresh uh, stir-fry type of vegetable. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is just a whole array of winter squash. Uh, I think you said, Bobby, you grew 23 different squash last year, is that yeah, right? And there are just hundreds of varieties oh, that are wow. available, but uh, these are all, uh, uh, with one exception here, the same species, and yet the they look so much different. There's a great deal of variability that occurs in the winter squash uh, group. And this includes pumpkins, which technically are squash. Right, right. They're all in this cucurbit uh, group, so they're actually first cousins. They're very closely related, so these squash are really, uh, even though they look considerably different, uh, the winter squash are actually in the same family, same species as the uh, the pumpkin. All right, we're going to have to ask Tom to identify this one for us. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? Can That's you... Casper. Casper! Casper, the With friendly a C, though, squash. With a not a K, correct? The friendly squash, okay. yes, exactly. <laughs> the interesting thing here, this is the one pumpkin that isn't with all the other pumpkins. It's a different species entirely. Kind of sort of like me. 
Yeah, <laughs> and actually, uh, it's you very mean a close. different species yeah. entirely. Okay. All by myself. <laughs> very closely related. These are your uh, first cousins right around the outside of Casper. They're crowding there. me. Right. The ornamental gourds are actually very closely related to yeah. the white pumpkins. Beautiful right. picture, Bob. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we'll talk more about squash and about more vine crops, but we've got to get to some of these questions. Debbie in Cromwell wants to know, how do you divide a blushing bride hydrangea? Uh, kind of tough to do, you know, oh, okay. I mean, after, it's probably going to be at least 10 years before she really mm -hmm. wants to do that, before she gets enough size. But in the spring, if, it, if she has a decent sized crown or root mass, she can divide it early in the spring. Okay. And that's one of the um, hydrangeas. It is good and hardy. It's yep. in this endless summer collection, even though it isn't the endless summer, but it's, okay. uh, it certainly is hardy. A little bit of pink on the, on the flowers? Yeah, mainly mm -hmm. white. Mainly white? Yep. Okay. Well, where does the blushing come from then? Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay, never mind. I'm, I'm blushing. <laughs> Shirley from Munger says she has a squash plant that has pinpoint sized black bugs. Any idea what they are and what should be done to treat them? Well, she wants to look a little bit closer. If they're, if they're flies, I wouldn't worry about it at, at all. Uh, they could be, and more than likely they are, because mm -hmm. a lot of the beetles that can cause more of a problem are going to emerge just a bit, little bit later. So I wouldn't worry about them at all at this point. Okay. Uh, Jim from Duluth has cinch bugs in his lawn. Do they have to be treated yearly? And I know we've talked about cinch bugs before. Well, the first thing is he wants to make sure that he has chinch bug because an awful mm -hmm. lot of uh, maladies related to the lawn, a lot of fungal disease people attribute to chinch bug. Actually find the insect. Uh, they can be treated with uh, one thorough pesticide application and there really shouldn't be any need for an annual treatment. We see repeated treatments, not necessary, get them under control. And they will be emerging as things get warmer. That's why I'm a little surprised that he might have this problem evident this time of year. I wouldn't suspect it this early. Okay. Unless he's seeing just that dieback from last year where his lawn isn't coming in in spots. Oh, so. Okay. All right. Um, a, let's see. This is from Jane in Carlton. She has a 10-year-old spruce tree. No, I didn't want to read that one yet because we have a bunch of spruce tree. <laughs> we have a bunch of spruce, Sorry, <laughs> spruce and pine tree questions. I want, she had another question, though, about an 18-year-old rhododendron which has been beautiful up until recently, and especially this year, it doesn't look good. She's wondering, should she discard it, save some shoots, or cut it back? Well, you, probably the first of the three. Probably discard it. Um, if it's in a state of decline, they generally won't recover from that. Pruning it back, uh, they grow from the tips, so any kind of cutting that she's gonna do on it, it's gonna die back to, a, to the a lateral bud, which is gonna really disfigure the shrub. So if it's really in a state of decline and unattractive, she probably wants to remove it and replace it with something a little hardier and uh, a little more attractive at this point. So you know, I really agree. A lot of people really want to renovate those. They don't. They don't come back very well. No. And it could be 18 years out of a woody mm -hmm. like that and not real dependably hardy. I think she did pretty well with it, and it's yeah. time for a new model. Time for a new one. All right. Trade it in. Okay. Cheryl from Duluth has a dwarf crabapple tree that is broken. Can it be fixed? It's bent over and is budding. Boy, I've seen this happen. Um, yeah. People try to, you know, tie them up. What do you do? You're just referring to my yard. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's where I saw it. I think I saw it in my yard. You know, they are vulnerable. You get a lot of winter damage, and if, if it's that main leader that's broken off, uh, you can get ladders that come back. You can retrain them actually if it's a relatively young tree it might be worth that effort but you can actually take a band of uh, fabric or cloth and try to stake it uh, and try to redirect one of the lateral or horizontal shoots to to a vertical position and so I, I would still uh, try to uh, go through a recovery effort with it okay before All she right. gives don't up give up on that <laughs> crab apple yeah. yet <laughs> try, for a year, try right? first <laughs> okay um, and we had a picture that was sent in from Steve in Cloquet. It's of his boxwood shrubs that were planted last year. He says the new growth is brown and he's thinking they're sick. Is there anything I can do? Do they need to be destroyed? Um, so what do you guys think? I'm kind of questioning if, if that's actually the new growth. Mm. Um, it almost looks like to me, of course, boxwoods are evergreens, um, but if it is the new growth, it, it could be just really because of the cooler temperatures we've seen, um, it's really kind of slow to color. So I wouldn't panic. I would give it some time um, and really give it an, an opportunity to really recover from, again, okay. not real hardy for our region. We talked about the rhododendron right. and some right. of those, and he may be seeing some of the struggles of that, but mm -hmm. it looks like it's going to be okay. Yeah, some of it's pretty green, so yeah. stick with it, Steve. 
Okay. Well, we'll have more questions coming up later, but in most gardens you'll find an array of blooms or a variety of vegetables and fruits or maybe a combination. Well, here now is an elegant city landscape with something different. Hi, I'm Dennis Lamkin and welcome to my garden on 21st Avenue East in downtown Duluth. Um, our garden is, is not a flower garden, it's much more of a, an architectural type landscape where we've got uh, uh, the center area here is actually called a trappist vert uh, with a patch of grass and surrounded by willows and, and uh, arbor vitae and uh, some hardscape, uh, the orbs and the, the fountain and things like that. We have hostas, we have uh, some uh, uh, Wilton carpet junipers, some blue form junipers and things like that. Kind of going for a blue, green, gray kind of uh, scheme in here with not a lot of pops of color. Uh, even in the in the uh, pole planter there, we have a sweet potato vine, uh, dark uh, purple sweet potato vine, trying to keep it as uh, simple as we can. We mow the lawn virtually every single night. And uh, we use the old-fashioned reel-type push mower. It uh, seems to do a nice job, and you're only cutting off a very little bit at any time. So it, it kind of keeps it thick and lush and keeps it growing quite nicely. I think most people typically do geraniums in the, in the urns and things like that, and I didn't want to do that, so we just did the Dusty Miller and the, and the uh, spikes in the center, Dragon's Blood spikes. We use the, the Wilton carpet, the blue carpet junipers here, uh, because they're a prostrate form, they lay flat, we get a lot of snow, we have to shovel, you know, the sidewalk is heavily trafficked, so we keep it clear in the winter. Um, a variegated dogwood, the junipers, uh, Euonymus, uh, a holly in the back there, uh, and then the globe form uh, blue spruce here to just add, to keep the, the blue-green theme kind of going here. Upper yard we did mainly for the view coming down 21st Avenue East. It, uh, the mass planting of the uh, globe uh, barbary. Uh, then we have the, uh, the planting beds here. We actually have three uh, stripes that we call, we call it the swoosh garden. Uh, the first one is uh, snow in summer, and in, in uh, June it uh, gets just a mass of white flowers. And then we have the, the, the river rock just as a uh, feature, you know, it's an accent. This is uh, Art Artemisia, and uh, it just has a nice texture to it. It's so soft and, and willowy, and, and the colors are right for what we're trying to do with the yard. After going to New York many times, you see they always have these uh, sidewalk planters. So we have our own little sidewalk planter here where we plant it again with kind of a muted color scheme. It makes the boulevard a little more interesting. We did a mass planting of bird's nest spruce over here. Again, just for the, the repeat pattern and the colors. Uh, again, to repeat what, a little bit what we have on the other side. Uh, and then a coleus uh, plant that's obviously likes its spot there. It's doing very well this year. Uh, we're trying to train some vines to go up the side of the house just to soften it a little bit. The window boxes, uh, sweet potato vines on either side there. Just again, they look nice. Uh, the lime green color looks nice against the, the dark brick of the house. And we have little pops of color, but not a lot. And for a very small yard, a very small garden area, you know, I think we've packed quite a bit into it. Unique uh, landscape, but very yeah. lovely. And of course, Dennis uh, was also on Duluth Garden Flower Society's mm -hmm. secret garden tour last year. He and John's garden, and such a beautiful space yeah, that they is. have meticulously maintained and love to share it with people. Mm -hmm. Great gardeners. Mm -hmm. nice example. Wonderful. Community spirit. Okay, back to some talk about vine crops, though, and uh, not just squash and pumpkins, but we're talking about melons as well, and we have a few to show folks. The first one, we're looking at is the um, sweet favorite. And that's a pretty good size melon for these parts. Yeah, that one grew that in in Brule. That'll cool. feed a family of four. <laughs> <laughs> last year, I'm assuming when we really last had, year, we yes. had melon uh, temperatures last year, so we, uh, we may have to ratchet our expectations down, down just a little bit. Maybe it might not get one like that, that this like year. That looks like a variety that we're familiar with. Is that's that sugar a sugar baby? baby, it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are any number of uh, both watermelon as well as uh, must melon and uh, uh, honeydews that we can grow, but they tend to be a little smaller, a little shorter okay. season varieties. 
This one, uh, how long about would that take to grow? That's going to take most of the season mm -hmm. and part of next year, maybe this year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that looks like uh, garden sir, humor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we got we got to laugh about this one a little bit. Uh, well, you can grow them in these parts, but you yes. really need a warm summer. Yeah, and, and select varieties. You know, Minnesota midgets. This is Sarah's choice. There's Athena. They're, they're all shorter season melon varieties. Uh, Luck, Lucky Sweet and Sugar Baby, Sugar Doll. These are all varieties mm -hmm. of watermelon that will really do quite well for us in this area. And and if you are going to plant them and want to try it, plant them in the warmest space in your yard. Okay. So if it's on a south side or a west side, even up by a shed or something mm -hmm. like that, you, that you get more radiant heat will help. So can you start those inside or not necessarily? You really can. You can start them and transplant them out. Uh, you know, really, they should be started toward the end of May, and then the, you can get a little jump on the season that way, okay. certainly. All right. Okay. Well, on to more questions from our viewers. Adela from Cloquet has two large maple trees. Something's biting holes into the bark. Is it a sap sucker? And if so, what can I do to protect the tree? You know, it depends on the hole, I think. If it's a series of holes, sap suckers are very distinctive, and... Uh, it's a maple, which could have gone after the, the sap. I think she does want to uh, get a collar of hardware cloth or screen, something that the, or burlap, uh, to prevent them from doing more damage. They tend to come through once, and then you get a whole series, and eventually it's very, very difficult for the tree. Yeah, and generally you don't see that kind of damage on a maple tree. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're usually attracted to a little bit softer wood like crab apples and apple trees, things like that. So. You know, you're right. If it's a young tree, though, it may be, or if it's a, sugar, if it's a um, silver maple, which is a little soft, softer, or one of the soft yeah. maples, mm -hmm. could very well be. Yeah. All right. Linda from Duluth says, what should be done with the strawberry vanilla hydrangea to maintain it? Nothing. Enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. okay. um, they're beautiful, and again, it's mm -hmm. one of those that we referred to earlier that are hardy for our region. Maybe just a little bit of cleanup pruning as it's as the buds start to open. They're really just in the process now of opening. If she had any kind of deer damage or browse, just kind of take off those tips. But really, uh, it's meant to be enjoyed. So. And right. it does bloom on some of last year's old wood, yeah. so it's a very, very nice variety. A little fertility now could help too, but uh, keep the weeds out. A little fertilizer, and they're they're good to go. Okay. Uh, is it safe to plant vegetables by railroad ties? There is a good question. I would stay away from any fresh creosoted material. If they're really, really old and, and a lot of that creosote is drained away, it's, it's possible you're not going to have a problem. I would line with poly. Uh, there certainly are better materials to make a raised bed out of than railroad ties. Yeah, okay. exactly. Um, that's from Gail in Woodland, who also wants to know how to get rid of buckthorn, as does Marion in Duluth. What can I do with my buckthorn? <laughs> um, well, you have to remove it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's or, or some kind of eradication effort that a lot of folks have really turned to now just slashing the bark and treating it uh, with a, a pesticide or trying to pull it. A lot of folks had had uh, basically a car jack that they used to jack the entire root system out of the ground. Some level of success, very difficult to control, but the earlier you get it, the better. Okay. Could I just comment real quickly as a safety factor? There are these materials, these brush killers out mm -hmm. there. Uh, they're not restrictive, but I'll use a name brand here, Garland. You have to be very careful. Yeah. Uh, there's the potential for eye damage. Eye damage. I'd mm. rather see people uh, cutting it at the ground level sure. and then spraying the re-sprouts with a product like glyphosate or Roundup, which is much less toxic. Okay. That would be a better choice. Stay away right. from the garland. I think I would. Yeah. Oh, darn it. We're running out of time. But real quickly, uh, can you... Can you grow coral bells? Are they hardy in Duluth? And what's the what's the um, technical name for them? Hookara. Hookara. Yeah. Uh, sure. There's yeah. a lot of varieties. Palace purple is probably the most popular one with deep dark burgundy leaves. But there's strawberry parfait, raspberry parfait, uh, twist and shout. There's like 50 or 60 okay. varieties that are available. So. Good. And just. Uh, Real quickly, two suggestions on growing vine crops in, in the straw bale method because we're talking about vine crops today. Can we answer that in 20 seconds? Real quickly. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think you can do that next year if you All haven't right. already conditioned the bales. The key to straw bale gardening is you really have to get start this breakdown of the straw process. That's going to take you another 10, 12 days. And by that point, uh, we're well into the season and it'll be a little late to get those squash out at the other end. So, yes, it can be done, be done successfully, but I think next year would be Better the wait. best year to try. Okay. Yes. Well, our gardening friends are always generous in sharing a look at the things that please them in the garden. Here's this week's Grow and Show. From Mary Laura to look at the successes of last season, including her sprawling snowball plant. This pink sunrise morning glory, 
and the wave petunias encircling her carousel horse. Trish Northey was pleased to see this bright chartreuse sedum grow up from a hole in a rock where she plunked it in her Two Harbors yard a few years back. Trish found the zigzag pots on a trip to the Branson area and filled them with sunny, colorful annuals to make this charming vertical display. Why not show off some colorful displays from your garden? Send us your favorite pictures via email to greatgardening at wdse.org or mail them to 632 Niagara Court, Duluth, Minnesota, and we'll include them in an upcoming show. We love the clever things people yeah, do with pots. Beautiful. That was adorable. We do have time for just um, one more series of questions, and we've gotten quite a few in about uh, pines. And a spruce tree that's 3 to 12 years old that's turning brown, that's from Bill and Superior. Another, a white pine, 4 to 7 feet tall, turning brown at the top. That's in Duluth, and then a uh, 10-year-old spruce tree in Carleton. This year, the needles near the trunk are brown. Okay, all kinds of things yeah. going on here. <laughs> but the, what, the one common thread, these are all relatively young trees, and mm -hmm. they're at the point where they can be vulnerable to a number of disease issues. The last one, I think, near the trunk, we're not going to worry about that. That's probably natural Three needle, growth, yeah. needle drop. The white pine, uh, at this point, uh, probably blister rust. Um, that's when they're very, very vulnerable. All you can do there really is, is replant. Young white pine, we want to prune them up off the ground level, take those lower branches off and get them away from the co-host uh, uh, that can transfer the mm -hmm. fungi. And, uh, so replant, meaning <laughs> <coughs> remove it and replace it, yeah, and let probably things, with a spruce. Let, let things grow at this point, because we're going to get some new growth, and some of this can be winter injury as well, a natural mm -hmm. needle drop. But uh, uh, of what we're hearing here, I think that the white pine may be the one that uh, may have more trouble okay. than we can control. Tom, before we say goodbye, we. Um, you planted a bunch of tomatoes today? Yes, I did. This week, uh, the Tomato Man project really wrapped up for this school year. We, uh, we ended up uh, with about 4,000 kids transplanting tomato plants Wonderful. that they're going to take home and grow for the summer right. and show us in the fall. That's a great project. Thank you to both of you for all your great expert advice tonight. Thanks to our phone volunteers. Go to our webpage for updates and links. But from all of us here, thanks for watching and enjoy the garden.